Okay. Okay, so for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Marion Forrester from Kerta, and I've been studying and making medieval pigments for three or four years now. Um, that's kind of my main area of study and something I really enjoy doing. And uh, if you have any questions while I'm going on, please just interrupt me and ask. Uh, because I probably won't be following the chat too well. Um, and you're more than welcome to contact me at any time. I've got my email listed there and um, my blog, which I haven't been posting on a lot lately, but there's some decent stuff up there. So how do we know what pigments they were using? Um, some of it is through scientific Study. We've, uh, scientists have sampled uh, tiny pieces of manuscripts and paint. Uh, sculptures were painted. Um, and, uh, the same pigments were used for both cloth and for painting. Um, we also, and you could also use non-destructive analysis like Raman uh, spectroscopy to find out what pigments were you um, welcome to whoever joined us if you have any questions feel free to ask me as we go along uh, we just got started uh, we also know what pigments were being used because they wrote down recipes and how to make the different pigments and there's an amazing variety of these out there and some of them you can find free on the internet, and some are contained in books, and some haven't been translated yet. So um, those are a little bit harder to get your hands on, something that you can understand. We also have um, manuscripts and paintings that actually have people making or selling pigments, so we can kind of get an idea of what they were using there. We have trade documents for when they were shipping and buying different pigments and correspondence in the same kind of uh, vein. And surprisingly, we also have wills and inventories where they um, may have died and left behind the contents of their shop. And um, with lead white, that's a lot of what we know is um, that kind of thing. And archeological evidence. Amazingly, some of these pigments are still found in more of a raw form. There was a shipwreck that went down around Croatia and they were able to um, bring up a bunch of different pigments that they used. They had lead white in little cones and balls of lake pigments, which we'll get into pretty soon. So as I was just saying, they had different shapes and um, ways that you could use these pigments. Some of them would be stored as a powder. Some of them would be stored underwater so that they weren't getting a lot of oxygen to them. Some as clothlets, which are little pieces of cloth that have the pigment and probably alum also infused into the cloth. Um, the alum is to preserve the pigment and sometimes to affect the color as well. And um, as I just said, it, they also had shaped lumps where it may have been cones or balls or that kind of thing. So we can break down the kinds of pigments into three main kinds, organic, inorganic, and manufactured. <clears throat> Your organic are going to be um, both plant and uh, insect, and your inorganic are mostly minerals and manufactured have been uh, changed in form in some way. So here's just a basic overview of a lot of the pigments that they were using. I'm obviously not going to get into all of them today, but we're gonna cover quite a few of them. Uh, like lead pigments were very important. Uh, orpiment was 
found a lot in um, Celtic manuscripts and uh, we'll go through most of these. So organic, uh, again, these are mostly plants. Uh, the uh, matter root, Brazil wood, indigo, woad, uh, carbon black, those are all mainly from plants. The carbon black could be from either plant or animal. Um, lac and kermes and cochineal, those are both insect produced. So kermes and cochineal. Uh, most of the time you're gonna hear people talk about kermes. Uh, that they had both. Early on, they were mostly using kermes because that was mostly a European pigment. Uh, mostly cochineal comes from the New World. There are some species from the Old World. So they were using them before we uh, Europeans sailed to the New World, but um, not nearly as much as later. Uh, a lot of these have different names, and a lot of times the names can be very confusing. Both of these were called grana. Um, sometimes they were distinguished uh, a little bit by where they came from, um, like grana de indias, uh, the West Indies, or uh, the plant they grew on, cochineal de nopal, that refers to the cactus that they're grown on. Um, but sometimes we just don't know and we kind of have to infer on time and place. Uh, as I said, the Kermes mostly from the Mediterranean, but also from Poland and later Italy. Uh, Cochineal mostly from the New World, especially from Oaxaca, Mexico. And this was imported a lot from the Spanish and uh, they actually exported it to, I believe, Italy where they would make it into a pigment and then ship it back to Spain, where it was very popular as a uh, painting pigment. A lot of these um, organic pigments are not very light fast. So unless they are in a manuscript that's closed, they may not uh, be preserved very well. They may fade. And uh, these were either made into a lake pigment where they were combined with some sort of calcium carbonate. Um, and that could be anything from chalk to marble dust or uh, ground eggshells and then combined with um, alum, which preserved the color and this would precipitate out and you would have your pigment. They could also, a lot of this was also used through um, cloth shearings. Cochineal was used as a dye and they would take the shearings from the cloth production and extract the pigment from those and use those in painting. With, I have a question if you don't mind. Absolutely. Uh, with the cloth shearings, is it cloth that's impregnated with the pigment? Yes, yes. Yeah, so they would dye the cloth and then take little bits of that cloth and uh, soak it in either water with gum arabic or lair, which is um, more of a refined egg white, and that would bring the color out, and then you could use that to paint. Okay, thank you. Matter root. This was another one that was used as a dye and as a pigment. And the difference between a pigment and a dye is a dye impregnates your material. So like a cloth, you dye, and with a paint, it's a pigment. It kind of sits on top, it has a binder, and uh, that's how it stays on the paper is something sticky like gum arabic or glitter or uh, egg tempera or something like that. Uh, matter root, it, we have uh, documentation from way before the medieval period. The Egyptians were using it. Uh, Charlemagne encouraged people to grow it. Um, it was used in Rome and um, just kind of used. Not surprisingly, one of the main producers was in Flanders, which was a high um, fabric area and so this was used as a dye and then exported as a pigment as well. 
It was also used as a dye for leather. So it started in textiles? Um, as far as I can tell, that's probably where it started. It was also used as a pigment way back um, with the as well. So um, just kind of, they used what they had. And if you can use it for multiple uses, Brazil Makes sense. was a huge uh, pigment that was used. I you will see if you read books on pigment recipes, there will be probably five to ten recipes on how to make Brazil wood. They're all pretty close to the same, but a little bit different. Um, a lot of times, this was made into a lake pigment. You could also make it into an ink. Um, it's a little bit. If it could be anything from yellow to orange to purple um, and red kind of all over. It's very pH sensitive. Um, and there were different trees that were used for this. Um, in the beginning, um, this was mostly a later pigment uh, starting around the early Renaissance and being imported from East Asia. And as the Europeans um, started trading with the New World, they found the trees in the New World and they called this place Brazil after the tree and the pigment and uh, um, started importing it in large numbers. And from completely different trees there. I was gonna say, are all of those from the Brazil wood? Yes, yeah, uh, the pictures up there, those are all from the exact same batch of Brazil. Um, the orange is, before I did anything to it, yellow has a little bit of cream of tartar added and uh, potash and uh, I believe there's something else with the purplish ones. Um, so just completely different pHs and there's a recipe in one of the manuscripts calling for or that gives instructions for four different colors from Brazil wood and that was wow. all from the same extraction just with different things added. Wow. Uh, lac is a uh, insect resin from the Caria laca insect. And again, that's from Asia. They were doing a lot of importing from Asia. And this one was mostly from India. Um, and here of um, shellac, it's also the same insect. It's just a little bit different process. Um, the lac that they used for the pigment, um, it's, um, it was made into a lake pigment and uh, used that way. And that's a beautiful purplish red. Pretty. Indigo and woad. They, again, very confusing uh, words there because they called both of them. They have to pay attention to if they say Baghdad indigo or if they say that it was um, flory or flower of something or maybe they might actually use the word woad but a lot of times it was just indigo <laughs> be careful about uh, which plant they were using it comes out to be the same um, chemical indigotin and um, it's kind of interesting when you extract it it starts kind of as a green and then uh, your chemical process turns it to blue um, indigo ferro, which is the true indigo, uh, they called it Baghdad indigo because that's where they were importing it from, not necessarily where it was being grown. Um, and when they started trading with the New World, they started growing it in Guatemala and El Salvador and uh, importing it through Italy, Spain and Portugal. Woad was kind of growing all over, and so it was an easy blue pigment. And a lot of the pigments that they thought may have been um, ultramarine or some sort of uh, 
mineral pigment was actually found to be woad or indigo. Is woad a resin? Uh, woad is a plant. And okay. look at the bottom picture there, that is a woad ball. So they've taken the leaves and just kind of mushed them together to kind of preserve them until you can extract the pigment and uh, do what you will with them, whether it's dyeing it or making it into a uh, painting pigment. And England was a huge supplier of this. And later on in period, they tried to protect their um, supply and would not allow uh, regular indigo to be imported or only to be imported at a very high price uh, so that they could protect their production. Uh, wow. They were using about any flower they could find. <laughs> so there are <laughs> uh, different um, recipes where they were gathering flowers and one of them was cornflower. If you've never seen this, it's a really pretty blue flower. Uh, you can grow it about anywhere and you just extract the juice and then combine it with either some sort of calcium carbonate, most recipes they do some, or you can use lead white. Um, Would you distill it? Uh, you just kind of crush up the petals and squeeze them through some kind of cloth and then pour that juice onto your kind of white thing to give it body. And uh, if you mix it with lime, you can make it into green. Again, it's pH sensitive. Um, the chemical in there is a group of chemicals called anthocyanins, and they're known for being pH sensitive, just like the Brazil wood. Uh, I have a few examples of where you can find the recipes there. Most of those are in a book um, by Maryfield, and if you're interested in that book, let me know, and I can send you a link to. Um, a copy on the internet or you can buy it it's a huge book but if you're interested in pigments that's the one. Oh so yes this squish with bilberry which is a vaccinium which is uh pretty much a blueberry that um, is more purple if you look at the blueberries we eat around here they kind of have green in the middle and these are a bit more purple uh, they also used elderberry and red poppies and you would get a purple from the poppies. So again, that pH sensitive is uh, changing your color quite a bit. And you, there's a recipe where you just walk through the fields and gather flowers and keep the flowers of one kind together and squish out the pigment. One of my favorite is iris or columbine green. It starts out as a blue or purple, depending on what color your irises are. And again, you crush the petals, squeeze out the juice, and they had different ways of producing this pigment. You could either squish it into a seashell, which the calcium carbonate in that will change it from green, or you could make it into a clothlet, which is underneath the seashell on the bottom picture there. And uh, that blue cloth, again, if you put it into a seashell, add some a uh, binder like gum arabic or uh, egg layer, that will turn it to green with the calcium carbonate of the seashell. And um, another way you could turn it from blue to green is by using quicklime, which is calcium oxide. And this was again a, a later um, pigment. Most of the organics are and it's not the most light fast, but it does make a pretty glaze, um, which is just kind of a more transparent color. You may have heard of turnsole or folium. It's kind of a weird word. Turnsole could be a lot of different plants used. Um, folium is the Chrysophora tinctoria plant. And you know that it's absolutely that plant when it says something about triangular seeds, which you don't really use the seeds, you use the seed pods. And from this, you could get red, blue, or purple. And um, it was also used as a dye, as most of the organics were. And uh, if you look there, they were using ashes, which you'll see either ashes or lye a lot of times, and urine. Uh, nice uh, readily 
available um, ingredient. A lot of times instead of urine, you'll see vinegar or wine or something like that. And again, quick lime to change your color. Uh, one of the ones that a lot of people don't know of are Orsine or Oracle. And this is a lichen dye and they're finding it in more and more manuscripts through the non-destructive Raman spectroscopy. And this is mostly from a lichen called Rosella tinctoria. If you see tinctoria, a lot of times it's a dye or a pigment. Um, <clears throat> and Italy was producing a lot of this. A lot of times, again, you could um, take it out of the cloth um, that they may have just used for making clothing. Um, and this is either a red or a purple. And they were also dyeing parchment with it. There is a red uh, parchment book out there that was mostly used with the orcine. Uh, sap green and buckthorn yellow. They're from the same berry but at different harvested at different times. So if the berries were not quite ripe yet you get the orangey yellow that you see in the background there. Uh, if it was completely uh, ripe you would get sap green uh, also called uh, pasta verde, which I think is kind of fun. And there's lots of different um, uh, recipes for this. It was used both as a paint and ink and a dye for cloth and leather. Uh, again, if it makes color, use it for everything. Weld. Uh, if you've heard of Weld County, Colorado, uh, <laughs> it's been imported here. It's kind of a mess and uh, likes to take over places, but it's growing here. Uh, they imported it and now it's running wild. Um, this is kind of a greenish yellow, um, whereas the buckthorn was more of an orangey yellow. It was also used as a fabric dye. If you see um, like the Robin Hood green, it was a combination usually of weld and woad. We know it was being used in Florence, um, Sonino Sonini in Il Libro dell'Arte, where the Craftsman's Handbook mentions it. And if you want a basic look on how artist materials were being made, uh, that is the book. It's like $5 and very easy to uh, get a hold of on Amazon. Uh, Let's see. It was also made into a lake pigment um, and saffron. Not just good for cooking, you could also make it into a pigment. And it was not very light fast, but it makes a beautiful orangey, lemony yellow. Um, it's made from crocuses, fall crocuses, and uh, lots of different recipes there. It was used both as a lake pigment and a stain. Carbon black is an incredibly fun one to make. All you need is some sort of um, container that you can keep most of the air out of. I've seen people use tin cans and close them off with aluminum foil or something. I've had those kind of melt, so I use a pipe fittings at the end and I throw that in the fire with my material. This one was something that you could use about anything that had carbon in. So wood, ivory, uh, almond shells, peach pit. Um, and if you look in the little dish there, that is uh, mammoth ivory. Since I can't get a hold of elephant ivory, mammoth ivory is uh, legal to own and use. And uh, it makes more of a, and you can see on the right there, that the colors are different. It's not just black, black, black. You have brown black and you have more bluish black. Um, the one I hate making the most is the lamp black. It seems to take forever to get the soot to accumulate and uh, it resists adding water to it when you make it into a paint. Uh, they were using some uh, carbon black as ink but mostly in uh, the Middle East as opposed to Europe. 
Okay, we're going to switch to inorganics now. And these are mostly um, rocks, but we have more of dirt at the bottom there in the earth pigments. Malachite, beautiful green color. Um, and uh, sometimes you'll see some sort of reference to it being from Germany or mountain. Germany was one of the biggest um, miners of malachite, which also hangs out a lot with azurite. And we're finding more and more that they were not using ultramarine, they were using azurite. And uh, the illumination there is one that I did using my azurite. You can't tell it's not ultramarine. Um, if somebody tells you absolutely that's ultramarine or azurite, unless they have a chemical analysis, they really don't know. After a while, azurite can turn a little bit green, um, but it was a lot cheaper to use than ultramarine, which takes a whole lot more uh, refining to get the pigment to look pretty. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, azure was the word that they were using, so it could have been either ultramarine or azurite, and it's kind of hard to tell unless they say mountain azure or uh, Alman azure or German azure or something like that. Um, later on, they found it in the Dominican Republic and started importing it. So ultramarine, this is the one that everybody knows of. And the pretty blue in the background of the illumination on the bottom is ultramarine. It comes from lazurite, uh, which is the mineral. And lazurite also hangs out with cal uh, calcite, which is clear. So in order to get the pretty dark, deep blue, you have to remove that calcite. And that was usually done with a paste of beeswax, gum mastic, and pine rosin. It was not used very much before the 14th and 15th centuries, but once they got the production um, figured out, they were making quite a bit of it. A lot of it was being refined in Italy, even though it was being mined almost exclusively in Afghanistan. Um, and uh, if you catch me at another time, I will uh, bend your ear on uh, how uh, the Medici's were uh, kind of controlling the, uh, as the ultramarine production at that point. Orpiment, if you see the Celtic um, manuscripts with the pretty yellow dots all over the outside, that's orpiment. And orpiment doesn't always play well with other pigments, so that's why you see it around the outside a lot of times. Uh, if you get it in with uh, sometimes lead pigments or arsenic pigments, um, it'll change the, um, change the other pigment to black. Um, and orpiment is poisonous. Don't go licking any medieval manuscripts, although I don't think you would. Um, most of it was coming from Austria and Saxony. They seem to have been doing a whole lot of mining around there. And uh, they were also getting some from as far away as uh, Kurdistan, Syria, and China. So a whole lot of importing and exporting going on. Uh, if you hear ochres or sienna, umber, those are all earth pigments. Those were just dirt. So find your prettiest dirt and dig it up and um, take all the organic matter out of it and you would have a beautiful pigment. You could even find colors like green and that was mostly in Italy. <clears throat> uh, they also had Armenian bowl, which was used both in gilding and um, in gesso and um, just using a pretty red color. Uh, you could change the color of umber or sienna by roasting it, and that's where you get your burnt pigments. Finally, we have the manufactured pigments, and these are things like vermilion uh, smalt, which is in the um, smalt and lead tin yellow were both used as uh, glass colorants. 
and also lead, lead pigments, which were very important at the time. So we have another poisonous one, vermilion. Uh, also, you could use cinnabar, which is uh, redstone, and it's the same chemical, just naturally occurring. Uh, if you were getting cinnabar, which was earlier period for the most part, um, you'd most likely be getting it from Alam Almaden, Spain. Um, that's where most of it was being produced and then importing. Um, and later on, they were getting a lot from Mexico and Peru. Uh, vermilion was made, uh, it's a mercuric sulfide. So you added mercury and sulfur and you could make that anywhere. Uh, Spain was again a big producer. They love their vermilion, uh, but Antwerp seemed to be doing it better. And we have recipes as far back as 800 AD. So they were using it all through uh, the time period, but it may darken to black um, when exposed to um, the air. But it was pretty stable. Uh, all of the mineral pigments are pretty stable and won't fade very well. Smalt is a blue pigment and it's a blue glass. Uh, I've seen either as ground glass or as something very similar made with cobalt ore. Um, it was cheaper than ultramarine, so it was easier to use, but it turned very transparent when used with oil. So it wasn't used much in oil paint, more for uh, figures and books and painting or, and uh, that kind of thing. Uh, again, if you refine something, it's going to be more expensive. Uh, so refined smalt was worth a lot more. Um, I, it, not surprising since it's a glass colorant, they were producing a lot of this in Italy. Uh, Murano, if you've heard of Murano glass or Murano beads, um, that is one of the cities in Italy that was doing a lot of glass. And so they were producing a lot of this pigment as well. A lot of the ore itself was coming from uh, Germany. Again, a lot of stuff being mined there. Verdigris, one of the easiest pigments to make please wear protective equipment if you do. <laughs> it's very easy to make with a sheet of copper that you suspend over vinegar, or if you wanna do it another medieval way, you can suspend it over urine. Uh, same type of uh, acids. Um, and then it's just the, um, the oxidized material, just like you see on the Statue of Liberty. You could make it with salt or copper filings um, or copper sheets. Uh, and it was, you could find it in a lot of different varieties, anything from green to a dark deep blue. And they used a lot of this, although it can be kind of corrosive on um, paper or parchment. And we get the name vertigris from vert de Grease, which was where some of the recipes were from and that got changed into vertigris. Uh, France was a major production center and they would uh, ship it all over and it was traded a lot by Italy and later Flanders. Lead pigments, uh, these were incredibly important, both lead white and yellow orange, even into the reds. Um, lead white was used not only as a uh, pigment, but also in gesso. It was used in oil paints and it helped dry the oil, um, paint. It was used with gum arabic, egg yolk, about anything you could put that was sticky. Uh, it, they were also using it to make lake pigments. With the lake pigments, you can make them with calcium carbonate, but sometimes they would also uh, add lead white instead of the calcium carbonate. Uh, main producers were Italy and Flanders, and the Venice lead white was prized more than any other uh, lead white. And they had found a way of producing this that took out the impurities and made it much 
um, more white and uh, less transparent. And a lot of times this uh, was called ceruse instead of just lead white. And this was used all through the period uh, from the beginning to the end and way before. Uh, still use some today. And lots of different names for it. This is one of the pigments that they found in the shipwreck. They found it in what they called, what are kind of truncated cones. And uh, you can still find pictures of those online. It's pretty cool. Other lead pigments, the names can get kind of confusing. There's litharge, which is generally considered yellow lead, and red lead, which is minium. And if you hear about miniature paintings, it comes from minium. Uh, um, lots of, although you could make it anywhere, uh, there were certain places that were importing it, um, and England was one of those places. Lead tin yellow. This was another one that was added to glass. So not surprisingly, you were getting a lot of it from Florence and Venice. Um, this was one that was not used all through period, but later on. And uh, it was also called massacot. And massacot's a uh, Nobody agrees on exactly what massacot was, but it seems to be uh, lead tin yellow, and some people argue it's just a uh, lead oxide. Um, a lot of different manuscripts were uh, had recipes for this. Even Leonardo da Vinci had his uh, mentioned it. It's a pretty pale yellow, and was used mainly beginning in the 13th century on, but it really came into being in the 15th to the 17th centuries. Okay, so that's what I have. If anybody has any questions, uh, now is a great time. Feel free to ask away. Do you have a compilation of the different recipes that you have tried? Uh, I do, and I can send that to you if you're interested. Um, Very. Okay, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. it's a rather large document, but uh, yeah, I've, I've got a lot of them that I've tried. Just because I dye my own wool and I'm working on a project right now, mm -hmm. um, for the SCA where I'm trying to use as many historical practices as I possibly can with what I can get in modern day, right. um, taking it from freshly shorn to a finished product. There are also some um, dyeing handbooks that are available online. Uh, if you're on the Outlands Fiber group, uh, that was posted, I think, today or yesterday? I am relatively new to the organization and oh, I'm not aware of the fiber group and I would love to become aware of the fiber group. <laughs> yes, yes, it's on Facebook. Just look for Outlands Fiber. Outlands Fiber, thank you. Great. Um, is there, are there specific um, dyes that work better on like wool and things like that as opposed to leather? Uh, that I don't know. Um, I've seen a lot of the same ones referenced for both. Um, it, the medieval pigment uh, manuscripts for like painting have a lot of overlap, especially with leather. So I have a little bit more um, understanding of those, uh, not really like wool or um, cotton or linen or anything like that. Okay. I learned a lot today. I really appreciate you. Am I the only one in this class? Because I'm the only one talking. <laughs> no. Nope. You're just the only one talking. <laughs> Sorry. I have a question. Um, 
around the 12th century, England became more industrialized and there was a lot of manufacture going on. Did that impact the pigments and trades at all? Or were they such a minor source that it didn't really matter? They stuck to arrowheads and other things. Uh, they seem to be doing a lot with wool. Uh, so a lot of the pigments that are uh, fabric pigments, they were also exporting, uh, like the woad. Um, they grew a decent amount of woad and matter, uh, but a lot of those were kind of all over. So there wasn't a whole lot of trade in it. It was mostly local. Was the indigo grown in the colonies the same stuff they had in the Europe? Europe? Was yes. it imported or was yep. it native? Yeah, no, it was imported and uh, grown the, um, the Asian varieties that they were importing and growing there. Does it grow wild in the East now? Or? Uh, I believe so. Um, that's where the production started, so I'm anticipating that's where it kind of originated. Okay. I'll hang out for a couple more minutes or you're free to go on to your next, um, your next. This is really, really cool. I love learning about the pigments. <laughs> Okay. This is better when they got to come to the class. <laughs> <laughs> uh,